Hi, so we're looking at SNORT uh, intrusion detection system, or um, it can also be configured as an intrusion prevention system. Uh, it's very popular, free open source software. It's been around for a long time, so it's very mature and stable. Um, there are lots of different front ends that are available for SNORT. Um, so, you know, even to the extent that you, some of the commercial IDS systems that you purchase are essentially a front end to Snort um, running in the background. Um, but if you get Snort, there are lots of different tools that you can use to manage the Snort rules, to um, you know, give you a front end to do your configuration. Um, the, there's, Snort can log in a way that typically gets sent somewhere else, um, and you would use it as part of a larger um, same system where you, you, you know, you'd send it off to centralized logging. Um, but, um, Snort itself um, was acquired by Cisco relatively recently, so um, a lot of Cisco routers and devices can actually um, you know, include Snort and the ability to put Snort rules onto those devices. So if you're going to learn a IDS system, Snort's a pretty good place to start. It has a simple signature-based language so um, basically there are a set of rules that it uses to um, check against and so whenever there's network traffic on, a ne on the network where uh, Snort's listening it will you know um, process the the packets that it sees and you know do defragmentation and the rest of it so that it can um, view a stream of the of the information and then it will apply the snort rules and other preprocessors to what's on the network and then it will you know generate alerts and, and things based on what it sees. So snort's processing uh, looks a bit like this. So snort will actually you know do the packet capture and then it will do some pre-processing so it does things like stream reassembly, packet defragmentation. So you know, it collects all of the of the packets and actually generates a, a view of what's inside those packets and not just looking at the individual packets. Protocol decoding, so doing things like, um, you know, if it's HTTP traffic and it just happens to be um, like zipped, for example, it can un uncompress before it applies rules and, you know, it does other things like that. Uh, it does normalization and, and it can do non-rule based detection. So there are pre-processes, which is basically like a, a module or a bit of code that can um, look for um, certain things. And so there are lots, there are a few, you know, there are different pre-processes that you can enable. Um, and so it's kind of not using the normal snort rules, but it does its own thing to detect something. Um, and then after it's finished doing all the pre-processing, it uses the standard um, snort rule language. So, you know, when snort starts, it reads in all of the uh, different rules that need to apply, and then it it will basically run the all the packets or the process packets through det the detection engine to see whether or not it matches any of the rules. Uh, and then if it does, then it will start, you know, generate alerts or, and log logging and the rest of it. So the way it does that is it will actually prioritize what ha happens in that processing based on the, so this, this is the rule detection engine, will look at things like high level things like IP addresses and ports and things like that um, and check those first before it goes to do the more computationally intense things like looking at the actual content of the packets or trying to you know apply regular expressions and things like that. So you know, so it, it basically works through based on looking at the high level things first and then only if they match will it try the, the other things. So from a computational point of view, this is an advantage because it will use less resources. However, you should also be aware that if a snort rule specifies a port number and you run your service on a non-standard port um, or an attack happens on a port that it's not supposed to happen on, then that rule will be circumvented entirely. So, you know, that's one of the um, things that, you know, as I discussed in the um, videos about IDSs in general, is that it is possible to um, circumvent the rules uh, if you have a, a um, 
you know, often an attacker can be clever about about it. Uh, so it's something you need to think about when you're writing your rules, making sure that the rules are targeting, um, you know, the specifics of the attack and not, um, or the the general um, attack and not the specifics of a of a of a of a um, you know exploit code, for example. So snort rules look a little bit like this. So the you know this is um, they start with the action that gets taken when it matches. So for example, generating an alert, followed by the protocol, uh, for example, TCP, could be UDP. Uh, and then the source IP address, so the where the packet is originating from. Um, for example, you, you could put it either an IP address or you could just say any. The source port. So you could be forgiven for forgetting the fact that in all network communications, there is a destination port, um, which is the important one that everyone thinks about, basically. And then there's also a source port, which is often just a random number. Um, and it's how you you um, basically figure out when the packet gets back to the person who sent it. Um, you know, if you've got a client server protocol, often the source port ports are not that important until the packet makes its way back to the computer that sent the um, you know that that tried to connect to the server for example comes back to the client and that that port number is how the computer knows where to send the packet which program to send it to um, most protocols um, will just use a random number or sometimes within a range or it might be a specific um, one depending on the the protocol um, but often often you can uh, put any and then the direction um, followed by the destination IP address. So this is where the packet is being sent to. So for example, um, if you have a um, server, um, this is the server IP address and the destination port. Um, and so for example, here you could have a specific server that you cared about and you put their IP address and then a specific port that you want to listen um, to traffic on, so for example port 80, which is um, unencrypted HTTP traffic, like a website. Um, and then, so that's the high level stuff, and then in brackets we've got the, the, the more detailed information. So we've got the actual message that gets triggered. Um, so in this case, looking at top secret stuff. Um, and then you always have an SID, or at least in modern versions of Newer versions of Snort, you have to have an SID, which is a unique identifier for the rule. So we just have a big number, and we've got a revision number, which is um, you know what version of the rule it is. And then um, you know you can have other things. So for example, here um, we've got the fact that it's looking for a content of top secret. Uh, content rules will just look for literally a series of of bytes. Um, in the packet. Um, so it's just looking for an exact match, essentially. Um, but the content rules can include binary or text data. So if you use the pipe symbol, you can put hex in there and it will look for specific like uh, binary data, or you can put um, text uh, based matching, like this top secret. So if all of the conditions are true, then it generates the alert. Um, and the, you know, whatever action takes place. So, um, so yeah, actions are typically either alert, pass, log. Protocols can be things like TCP, UDP, or ICMP. Uh, directions can be in one direction or any direction. Um, pattern matching um, is slower than most of the other kinds of um, like rules that, that take place. Um, but it can include doing using content, which is the snort pattern matching, um, and which is fairly you know straightforward. It doesn't have the kind of complexity that you can do. You know, usually you've just got specific bytes and things that you're looking for. Um, compared to something like a Perl compatible regular expression, which has a lot more um, expressiveness, so you could match all kinds of wonderful complicated rules that you could write about there being you know, a certain number of 
characters or a certain number of the you know repetitions of a certain um, string, for example, you could do all sorts of things with regular expressions. Um, but it takes a more processing power to actually do that. And you also have to remember this is happening every time anything flows through your network. So you know if you start writing really complicated, lengthy regular expressions, then it could end up being a problem. Um, if you just have simple regular expressions, then you know you you're all right with modern hardware. Uh, but it is worth um, knowing that if you can write a just as good a rule without using regular expressions, then you, it's a good idea to do that, to do it that way. However, it, regular expressions gives you a lot more expressiveness that you can um, you can use. So you can also include classifications in your rules. So Snort has really good documentation about all the different um, things you can include in the Snort rules. So if you go to manual.snort.org. There's a, there's a whole bunch of information there, um, but you can also specify um, <clears throat> things like the um, class type in your rule. So if you can see here, um, the, the, uh, you could, so this, this example has an attempted recon uh, class type and there's a list of um, default classifications. You can create your own as well. Um, but if you look here, it's a good idea if you're writing a snort rule to include a classification. Um, but you can also include things like a priority. So that helps. Um, there's like a severity level, um, which is really helpful for anyone that's looking at monitoring the snort rules to know that it's something that you need to look at. So if you're writing your own snort rules, for example, because there are specific things that you want to look out for on the network, it probably makes sense to set the priority really high for those rules, so that you know if you if you're monitoring you know the rules and you're trying to um, uh, look at things that are high priority first, you can pull out those things and it gives you um, you know a way of making sense of all of that stuff that's that's logged. Um, so there are a number of different rules that you can use. So the content matching, um, you know, when you're looking at payloads, for example. Uh, you can also put a uh, not um, at the start of a, of the rule, like a a, um, a bang or a, a exclamation mark. And if you if you use that, then it looks for anything that does not contain <clears throat> that content, and it will trigger the rule. So if you look at this example here, you can see this is an alert on TCP. Anything that's connecting to port 80, if it's sending anything other than get a get request, then this is going to trigger a rule. So not get. So this would trigger on things like um, like a post request or a delete request. Um, you know that's going to generate a lot of alerts probably on you know modern um, way that websites are designed. But you might have specific web servers that you want to monitor for specific kinds of um, traffic. Uh, you could create rules for that. Here, when you have um, pipes, it it is um, using uh, like bytecode or hexadecimal representation within those pipes uh, to to match for um, things. Um, and there are a number of different things that you can use. Um, <clears throat> Then you can add to your rules to, to do different things. Like, for example, you could make it case insensitive by adding no no case. Uh, you can add um, depths and offsets, distances, um, to basically look for um, things within a packet at a specific location. Um, so that is faster than just trying to look for it anywhere within the within the packet. You can basically say, okay, within this data stream or whatever, like it, it, there's what we're looking for will always appear at this location. So, uh, you know, so there's a number of different things you can use there, and I would encourage you to look as you're writing snort rules. You'll basically be forced to, to to learn these things. But if you look through the documentation, there's there's lots of really good information. So, in terms of what happens to those alerts, you can configure snort itself to do different things with it. So you could send uh, alerts to syslog which is a standard um, Linux or Unix um, log, logging system. 
Um, there's the journal system, which is um, you know another Linux-based uh, logging infrastructure on modern Linux systems. You could send it to XML, XML files, into a database, into a log file. Um, you can, with a little bit of extra work, you can get it to configure across the network. You could get it to send you instant messages, for example, send you emails, SMSs, all sorts. So Snort can do this directly, um, but again, if you're talking about within a large organization, you probably want to centralize this stuff using a same system. So you, your, um, your IDS system is monitoring the network and all those alerts get sent centrally to you know, where you're doing your security um, monitoring. So the Sonore, um, you know program, you can run it and um, you can use it as a sniffer, um, for example. Um, and when you stop it with the control C, it will give you a bunch of stats. Uh, it's not the normal mode that Snort's used in, but it is something you can do with Snort. Uh, you can also use Snort to process a previous capture. So if you've captured some network um, traffic using Wireshark, for example, or TCP dump, you can create like a PCAP file, for example, and then you can feed that into Snort after the event. And you know you could use Snort rules to process through it to look for things. Um, you just do that with minus R and then the network capture file and it will read that in and process it for you. Um, in terms of using Snort, there are rule sets that are um, free and open source, such as the community rule set that Snort release. Um, and uh, if I recall, it's that's GPL um, licensed. Um, and there are other rule sets that you can get access to by registering with Snort. So if you register with Snort, you can get this stream of rules um, as they're released. And they do a thing similar to like what Nessus do with their, um, <clears throat> with their rule, um, rules for looking for vulnerabilities. But basically with what Snort does is you get this free stream, but if you are a free user, it's delayed so you don't get all the newest attacks and things. So there's like a 30 day delay or you can pay for access to the up to date version of the stream. Um, so, you know, it gives a balance of giving incentive for people that, that can afford to, and need it to get a um, up to date um, ability to detect like newer attacks that have just got brand new rules. Or, you know, if you're learning, for example, for educational reasons, you can um, make do with uh, older versions or even the community rule set while you're learning these things. Um, but it's important to realize that if you use Snort and you're not paying for it, then it won't detect the, the newest of attacks. Um, and in any case, they won't detect zero day attacks or people that are clever enough to write attacks that circumvent the rules that exist. Um, there's a caveat for you. So there are other snort rules that you can, uh, snort tools that you can get. So one thing you can do with snort is actually get it to log in a binary mode so that it uh, offloads the processing till later. So you can use third party um, process to write um, the, um, sorry, get it to log in binary modes and then um, offload the logging to a third party process like Barnyard um, that then does the, the logging um, as a separate process. Um, and Pool Pork is a Perl script that you can use to manage the rule sets and things. Um, you can uh, do, you know, download new rules and things for you. Um, but there's, there's a number of different tools that can do that. Um, in terms of monitoring sensors, there's various different like web interfaces and things that you can use. But as I said before, IDS has often feed the alerts to a security information and event management same system. And then, you know, the practicality of, of using these kinds of systems is you actually need to look at those log files uh, and make sense of all that information and do some investigations to actually determine if a security incident's actually happened. So the, those, log, those logs genera generated by Snort will include, can include false positives, um, 
which will, you know, there'll be alerts there that tell you something's happened, but actually when you investigate it, you'll find that there's an actual reason that those things are there. Um, so someone needs to actually have a responsibility for actually managing that stuff, looking through the logs, and then, um, you know, have your actual incident response process in place to deal with um, the events that, that you find. So we've talked about SNORT, but there are other intrusion detection systems, obviously. Um, Suricata um, is essentially very similar to SNORT, but it's multi-threaded. It uses SNORT's rule, same rule language, um, but they claim to, um, you know, there are additional features, and the main one being that it's multi-threaded. So whereas SNORT runs um, just on one CPU core, um, if you have um, um, Suricata, it can basically <clears throat> have multiple threads running and it will use multiple cores of the CPU. So, you know, in, in theory, that would means it can do it to um, faster processing. Um, Zeek uh, used to be uh, known as Bro, and it is um, free and open source software. It's similar to Snort, but it does more um, protocol analysis and kind of more complex rule possibilities of, that it's built into it. Um, and there's lots of plugins and things for, for Zeek. Um, but it does protocol analysis and it, it checks that, um, you know, what's happening on the network actually conforms to what you're expecting. So it has some um, anomaly-based detection of when things aren't matching the kind of behavior you'd expect, whereas Snort is mostly looking for offending behavior. So Snort is mostly looking for a signature of an attack, whereas Zeek does that, but it also has more of the um, anomaly-based detection features. Uh, but Zeek can also import and convert Snort rules to its own um, rule language, um, and um, it's and Zeek is quite popular with researchers because it has this like framework of um, that you can build on to do you know some really interesting stuff. So Cisco is the commercial um, vendor that has the best support for Snort, um, but they have their own IDS systems with their own rule languages as well as Snort because they've been doing it alongside Snort for many years as well before they acquired Snort. Um, then you've got Juniper Networks, IBM, McAfee, Tipping Point. There are lots of different companies produce ID commercial IDS systems and they'll all claim to be the best at what they do. Um, but they'll perform, they'll, um, you know, do these kinds of things in slightly different ways, optimize for different use cases. Um, but, you know, understanding Snort is a really good um, place to start with IDS systems because, as I said, you know, most of these products will be able to import Snort rules or, and understanding how Snort works will also help you to understand how all these other commercial products work. So, in conclusion, network monitoring is critical for raising awareness of what's happening on your networks. There are many options, including the free and open source software Snort. And monitoring rules, you know, you can write fairly straightforward rules, um, but they can suffer from false positives and false negatives unless you're very careful about how you write your rules.